I'm interested in uh, calcitonin family of peptides and, uh, and different peptides also, but mostly my work was done with, uh, with uh, this family of peptides. And you heard a lot about the CGRP, one of the family member, and uh, I was fortunate to work with uh, uh, Amelin and uh, adenomethamine also. So uh, this family is a big uh, family. Uh, the one uh, that we mostly talked about is the CGRP, but uh, there's also, also amylin, adrenomethylene one and two, uh, and the calcitonin. And uh, we mostly talked about uh, our work with the alpha uh, CGRP uh, in human models, but the beta CGRP is also found, especially in the gut system. Uh, and uh, little is known how it uh, has any effect on, uh, on migraineurs or something. Uh, these uh, family of peptides are, uh, uh, has complex pharmacology and uh, uh, they have uh, 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 multiple uh, uh, pharmacological and biological activities throughout the uh, human body. And um, most of them uh, are found in the tertiary uh, country of the <clears throat> yes, um, here is uh, uh, that I'm uh, showing is the complex uh, um, pharmacology of these uh, uh, peptides and the CGRP that you can see uh, that uh, uh, activates the CLR and RAP1 uh, receptor, which is the canonical CGRP receptor, but it can also activate potently the CL. CTR in RAM1, which is called amylin one receptor. Uh, these data are from the pharmacological studies, uh, mostly done in the cell types. Uh, but uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can see the other family members uh, also have an interaction, pharmacological interaction, with different types of uh, uh, receptors, like amylin is equipotently uh, activates the CTR RAM1, which is the amylin one receptor. And one of the important uh, pharmacology of these receptors are this, this RAM uh, uh, in the uh, cell membrane and, and, uh, and the CLR component. They are, they are actually uh, are fluid. Uh, they, are, they can join uh, and make different uh, uh, receptors like the RAM1, RAM2, RAM3. And, uh, it makes it more difficult to study uh, uh, and, and pinpoint the exact pharmacology of these receptors. But uh, for us, this uh, you know the CGRP, and we knew it from very long ago that it's not uh, efficacious in all patients. Around 50, 50 to sixty percent responding rates, uh, uh, and that is to non-responders. At the same time. The question was uh, that uh, where to look and, uh, and one of the uh, things that we can study is the family of these peptides as they are having this interaction with each other uh, uh, throughout uh, the human body. So it is the best place to look at them. And uh, uh, I was fortunate to look at these two uh, uh, peptides, the adrenomethylene and the uh, uh, the uh, amylin, uh, and they are, we are called the new uh, target for the treatment of migraine, because I can tell you uh, mostly about the amylin today, but we also shown that the adenomethylin also potently uh, induce migraine in migraine patients, actually, in 55% of uh, patients that... Um, so they are the targets, but uh, today I will focus uh, again uh, and uh, about, about the amylin and how uh, we uh, conducted the amylin uh, work. We use the primalentide. Actually, it's an analog of amylin because you cannot use the, uh, the, uh, the natural amylin peptide because of uh, uh, its uh, fibrogenic, uh, uh, and, uh, but, but primalentide is soluble and it's very stable uh, and already approved uh, drug in the United States. Um, we conducted a double-blind uh, uh, 
randomized uh, trial uh, head to head with uh, CGRP because CGRP now is, uh, is uh, we know that it plays a very important role in my brain. Uh, and we conducted also a, a translation study through the pharmacology to the animals and also uh, on humans. And one of the study, one of the very first question that uh, we answered was, is it, uh, is it, uh, is there any difference in their pharmacology? And you can see uh, from this, uh, from uh, here, uh, from the pharmacological study on uh, canonical CGRP receptor, that the CGRP, the difference between CGRP and permanentite is actually uh, over 1,000 for difference. It means this uh, uh, doses that we have used is not uh, activating the CGRP, the canonical CGRP receptor. Uh, and at the same time, it's enough to activate the uh, RAP1 receptor and do also the CGRP. And uh, we, we have found that the induction rate of uh, headache induction rate in both groups are uh, nearly uh, equal and there is no significant difference between them. Then there was a 90 to 95 percent um, uh, headache, only headache induction. When we looked at the induction of migraine between these two groups, there was no difference at all. Uh, there was 42% uh, 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 migraine induction after amylin uh, infusion and 55% after uh, alpha CGRP uh, infusion. Uh, and when we look at the uh, median time of uh, onset of migraine-like attack uh, after uh, uh, CGRP and after amylin, and they are nearly the same, and also the median time to rescue and take of medication is, uh, is uh, nearly the same. Um, and we did some uh, human uh, dynamic uh, measurements. We did the uh, speckle. Of course, the CGRP is one of the potent vasodilators, so you can see from the flushing. Uh, uh, but we have also seen that there is some uh, vasodilatory activities in the uh, facial vasculature after permanentite uh, infusion. And you can also see this difference uh, uh, in the radiance that is only in the uh, first 10 minutes. Uh, and our translation part of the study uh, that was carried out by uh, uh, Professor Russo's lab in the United States, uh, here we use this uh, amylin uh, that shows that amylin causes uh, cutaneous hypersensibility. Sensitivity in mouse, uh, in mice, uh, and uh, you can see mm, that uh, uh, when you look at the threshold between both male and female, it's uh, quite uh, significant. But when you all, when you see the difference between the male, female in male, you can see female is more uh, hypersensitized uh, compared to the uh, male. And when you, when we also looked at the uh, light aversion behavior uh, in these uh, after amylin and CGRP, and you can see uh, that after amylin, when you looked uh, the both uh, both male and female, there is no significance. But you can find a very interesting uh, result uh, in female uh, mice. So it's showing that there could be a, a, a six difference between uh, the effect of amylin. Uh, compared to CGRP, and you can see the CGRP is affecting uh, all uh, throughout the, uh, the uh, without any differentiation of sex. So we concluded this uh, that uh, amylin analog uh, permalentite induces migraine-like attacks in migraine without our patients, and uh, permalentite CGRP uh, differentially affects uh, arterial dilation in vital parameters. And uh, it causes uh, cutaneous hypersensitivity and light aversion behavior. Uh, and our findings propose that amylin uh, 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 can be as a novel contributor to migraine pathogenesis. And by that, I will thank uh, my mentor, uh, Professor Masuda Shena, and the collaborators, Professor Debbie Hay and Professor Russo. And
my co-author, Dr. Akarabudi, and the rest of co-authors of this uh, huge paper and my funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. If we have any questions from the audience. Thank you for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, would you like to speculate the, on the origin of the amylin, for example, in migraine pathology? Where would it come from? Because it doesn't seem to be a lot of amylin itself in the, the trigeminal vascular system. Uh, it's, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we also did some uh, uh, immunohistochemistry and we found very minute uh, level of uh, uh, amylin, the amylin peptide in the trigeminous uh, ganglion, also in human and, and, and the animal models. Uh, however, uh, when, you, when you do this immunohistochemistry, uh, because of uh, the uh, identical pharmacology and receptor pharmacology, and uh, it's very difficult to identify exactly how much it is. At the same time, there is so much CGRP that whatever uh, immune staining that you use, it will probably also catch the CGRP. So it makes it difficult. At the same time, we have the central uh, amylin production, and at the same time, it's a peripheral. Most likely, it could be peripheral because here you, you can find it in a very large amount uh, in the blood circulation, which is uh, circulating with the food uh, 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 when you are taking food during the day. Thanks. And a little to follow up on this one. Would you expect to see any difference between the antibodies against the CGRP and the CGRP receptor if uh, amylin was involved in, uh, in migraine pathology? Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't think that there will be any difference because uh, the CGRP uh, uh, NRVA is uh, selectively uh, blocks the the sequenolical CGRP receptor, but not the, the amylin uh, as much. Uh, but uh, there's only one study that's showing that fidonizumab was, I think, uh, if I'm not taking it wrong, uh, that, uh, that could have affected on both. Uh, but uh, it's very early, but I think it has, it has no effect. Thanks a lot. And before we move to the next presentation, one small question for me also. So in your crossover provocation study with amylin and CGRP, were the same patients that responded to both the peptides? Was there an overlap in people who responded? Do you have this kind of results? Or were they different group of patients mostly? We have, we have seen on the, uh, they are, uh, now I don't know exactly how much, but there are some people that, uh, uh, develop migraine on both days. Mm -hmm. There are also some people that's only uh, responsive to CGRP and only responsive to amylin. But uh, uh, most of them are responsive to both. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <laughs> and the next presenter is uh, Dr. Sandrik Goyo. Probably you saw him before at the debate. And uh, Cendric is a neurologist from Toulouse and has obtained his PhD from the University of Toulouse, where he is using MRI modalities to unravel migraine of physiology. And now he will give us a lecture. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. So, the topic of my PhD was the research of MRI biomarkers of stroke risk in migraine with aura. So we know that migraine with aura uh, increase, the, is, increase the risk of stroke and multiply this risk by two. And uh, migraine with aura is also a risk factor for silent brain infarcts and white matter abnormalities. Uh, several hypotheses have been raised. This is not comprehensive, but for instance, patent from association with patent from an ovale cervical artery dissection, mostly migraine without aura and arterial dysfunction, platelet hyperviability, and hypercoagulability. But we wanted to assess two other um, hypotheses. One, the first is the uh, lack of cerebral autoregulation in migraine with aura. 
previous studies have shown that there is uh, an impairment of the cell biota regulation in Magnus aura. The cell biota regulation is the physio physiological process that makes the blood uh, flow independent from the variation of the blood pressure. This is this plateau of cell biota regulation where the uh, blood flow is independent from the, from the variation of blood pressure. And the cell biota regulation is under control of the autonomic nervous system. And mostly this plateau is under control of the uh, sympathetic autonomic nervous system. And blood vessels inside the brain receive innovation from the brain stem, specifically for the uh, sympathetic innervation, comes from uh, the locus cerulius. So, uh, our hypothesis is that uh, the locus cerulius is uh, activating during migraine. So, our hypothesis was that we can. We, we, we have to find a correlation between morphology and a signal of locus cerulius and efficiency of uh, cerebral autoregulation. <laughs> uh, the second hypothesis uh, we aim to uh, uh, try to explore is the association between migraine with aura and atrial fibrillation, which has been found in several studies. And atrial fibrillation could be triggered by lesion or stimulation of insulin. And insulin is also uh, involved during migraine. So uh, we wonder if modification of connectivity of the insula of its activity could uh, explain uh, the risk of atrial fibrillation in a migraine with aura patient. So here's the rational. Migraine with aura is associated with an increased risk of stroke, uh, which could be increased by uh, an impairment of cell autoregulation, which is under control of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, in, inside the brain, the autonomic nervous system comes from brainstem nuclei. So maybe we can find a correlation between uh, the signal of the locus cerulius and deficiency of cell autoregulation. The second objective was to uh, assess uh, if any modification in the connectivity of the insula can explain modification of the autonomic brain network that could uh, facilitate and try to atrial fibrillation. So for the first hypothesis, uh, for the, the whole uh, experiment, we have the population of uh, 22 migraine with aura patient and 22 uh, uh, controls, age and sex matched. Uh, the migraine was quite active, but all the patients were uh, evaluated during the interictal period, not during the ictal period. So here, the first experiment, we assess the cerebral autoregulation by using a transcranial Doppler during 30 minutes, and in the same time, the blood pressure. And cerebral autoregulation is an index of correlation between the blood pressure on the finger and by photoplexomography on the finger and the velocities of the middle cerebral artery. When this index of correlation increases, it means that the blood flow is dependent from the blood pressure, and then the uh, cerebral autoregulation is weak. So higher is this index, weaker is cerebral autoregulation, lower is this index, better is the cerebral autoregulation. We also uh, perform an MRI with a specific sequence uh, measure, analyzing the neuromelanin, uh, this is a neuromelanin sequence, and the signal of the locus cerebrus here uh, revealed the accumulation of neuromelanin which is a degradation product of catecholamine. So it, it is used as a surrogate marker of the catecholamine energetic activity of this, uh, of this nucleus. So the objective was to find a correlation between the intensity of locus cerulis and the efficiency of cerebral autoregulation. First, we failed to find a difference in uh, cerebral autoregulation between magnums of patient and control. It was discrepant from previous data from the literature. And in fact, our patients were a bit older. They were around 48 years old. And in previous study, they were around 25, 30 years old. So we wonder if age um, could explain, uh, play a role in uh, these uh, discrepancies. And in fact, we have found that cerebral regulation, in fact, get better as time goes by, and there is a correlation between the efficiency of cerebral autoregulation and the age of patient, and this correlation was even better when considering the duration of the uh, 
uh, migrant uh, rather than the uh, edge. So it seems like the third order regulation is impaired in the beginning of the disease and then uh, improved uh, years after over the years. Locus cellulis was strictly the same between migrant with a rough patient and control. So it was not a memorized biomarker of migrant with aura. And regarding our uh, hypothesis, that was to find a correlation between the intensity of locus cellulis and cell regulation, we did find uh, a correlation, but this correlation was uh, weak. And we, when you look at the figures, you can see that the dots are quite scattered. So, didn't consider this result as uh, strong, and we cannot uh, uh, claim that there is a real uh, correlation between the intensity of acute cellulose and the efficiency of cell regulation. And considering the subgroups, the results were, were, were negative. The second experiment was uh, and the connectivity of the insula. Uh, we, has, we tested, we investigated the connectivity of uh, the insula in a comprehensive manner with a region of interest located on the right insula, left insula, anterior, posterior, uh, dorsal, middle, and ventral. And we, uh, in, in, in the experiment, we also assessed the heart rhythm of the patient, the heart rate, the heart rate variability, and the barrel reflex sensitivity to correlate this cardiovascular autonomic variables to the connectivity of the insula. The result is that we have found a strong correlation, a strong connectivity between the anterior, uh, bilateral anterior and dorsal insula with the uh, cerebellum vernis, specifically the vernis 6. Uh, this connectivity was, we, was not found in a subgroup, in a group of patients with migraine without aura that we had from a previous study. So it seems that this connectivity it appears that this connectivity is specific to migraine with aura and not migraine without uh, aura. Uh, it's important because the vermis uh, is supposed to be involved in uh, pain, uh, also in the trigeminal, uh, trigeminal vascular pain, but the fact that this connectivity was not found in migraine without aura did not support the hypothesis that this connectivity was related to the pain. However, some studies investigated the autonomic nervous system have found uh, <coughs> concomitant activation of the cerebellum vermis and the anterior insula during la the recovery of uh, uh, lower pressure, the decrease of blood pressure. Also, a uh, review of literature has shown that uh, cerebellum vermis and anterior insula are uh, involved in the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. So now from this result, we uh, wonder if the strong connectivity between insula and anterior insula and uh, the cerebral varies is um, an alert of the, paras of the parasympathetic uh, autonomic nervous system to face uh, the cardiovascular event that occurred during migraine aura. Of course, uh, further studies are needed to, uh, to investigate this hypothesis, but this is the conclusion we can draw from this uh, experiment. So here are the conclusion. We can say that the neuromelanin, uh, the signal of the neuromelanin by uh, neuromelanin MRI is not a good biomarker of migraine with aura. We have found that cerebral autoregulation improves uh, over the years in migraine with aura. And then we have found a strong uh, connectivity between cerebral, cerebral vermis and anterior insula that could be related to uh, parasympathetic autonomic nervous system and should be further investigated. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting presentation. And uh, if there are any questions from the online audience or from here. OK, then I have a question for you. I, I was wondering if the patients you included in your study they were mostly episodic or chronic migraineers, and if some of them had aura or not, and how this group, subgroups, could affect your results. But it was only migraine with aura patients. With aura. With aura, only migraine with aura patient. And for the MRI study, we uh, included a group of migraine without aura afterward from a previous study we've done uh, several years before. 
an old patient where episodic uh, migraine patient. We avoid chronic uh, migraine because we wanted to assess the, the cerebral to regulation uh, and the MRI at rest. Uh, not during a migraine attack that could, of course, influence and change the, the cerebral to regulation. And regarding the autonomic activation that you suggested, did you correlate it with uh, the patients experiencing, experiencing autonomic symptoms during their attacks, or did you assess that? No, no, I didn't correlate with this variable, and we didn't collect this variable because it's cranial, you, you refer to cranial autonomic mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, symptoms, of course, really interesting. And we focused on the cardiovascular autonomic uh, system, but of course, for for, for, for Next studies, we should also collect this data. Thank you. And we have a question from the audience. Hi. Uh, there are some biomarkers, MRI biomarkers, that uh, we can look in single patients with migraine tower for uh, the risk of strokes, or this is just for the general population? If we do have some uh, MRI biomarkers uh, for stroke risk, uh, in my conclusion, right now, no. We also Done all the analysis uh, of the, the, tensor, the diffusion tensor in the brain uh, to analyze the structure of white matter. So, for total ligand, even they have more white matter abnormalities. So, uh, for now, we have no uh, reliable uh, MRI biomarker. Thanks. And another question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, could we get maybe the microphone? Uh, thank you, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, we also know that migraine patients are more uh, likely to have uh, syncope, so there seems to also be an autonomic dysfunction in migraine patients in general. But I'm not aware that, it, that migraine with oral patients are more prone to syncope than migraine without our patients, how do these epidemiological but also neurophysiological data that are there in the, in the field of headache relate to your findings? Yes, yeah, so thank you for, uh, for this question. Of course, uh, yes, there is this, asso this association is uh, well established. And this was a bit the sense of also of this study because we investigated the autonomic nervous system. Uh, of course, regarding the risk of atrial fibrillation with the control of the arteries, but we also assess the sensitivity of the barrel reflex, uh, which could be weaker in case of syncope. Uh, in this study, we didn't find any differences, but some, in some other studies, uh, there are. Uh, maybe, of course, this connectivity between the cerebellum vermis and the uh, interancula, are, as they are uh, involved in the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, it means a higher parasympathetic tonus in this patient that could explain uh, this increased risk of syncope. And I really would like to investigate further this reason. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You. And uh, now we'll move to the third presentation of the Young Investigator Meeting, which is from Mohamed al Karhoyim. He's a medical doctor and also PhD from the University of Copenhagen with uh, extensive research on the involvement of potassium channels in migraine. So we're looking forward. Thank you. Can you hear me? So, hello everyone. My name is Mohamed El Karagoli and I'm going to speak about the role of ATP sensitive potassium channel in migraine aura and migraine pain. I have no disclosures to report. What do we know about migraine aura and pain so far? We know that GTN, the nitric oxide donor, can provoke migraine without aura in migraine without aura patients. We also know that we can also provoke migraine without aura in migraine with aura patients. But we cannot provoke Can you see the point of him? Yes. Yes. So we cannot provoke a, 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 a FHM with GTN. How about CGRP? With CGRP, we can provoke migraine without aura in migraine without aura patients, and also the same 
in migraine with aura patients, well, some of them reported aura, but we couldn't be able to reproduce the, the, the results, but we couldn't uh, induce FHM in uh, migraine and FHM patients. So now, the next is we have aura and we have headache. We have migraine aura and migraine pain. We know that there is some uh, correlation between the regional cerebral blood flow and migraine aura and after that also migraine headache. Because Professor Ullison reported that during the aura, we have a hypoperfusion uh, uh, actually with two, three minutes uh, 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 per millimeter. And after that, we will have hyperperfusions during the headache. But so far, we haven't any molecule that can be used to induce both migraine aura and migraine pain. That's why it has been very difficult to understand what is the role, the correlation, the relationship between migraine aura and migraine pain, and how CSD, which is thought to be the physiological substrate of migraine aura, is related to migraine uh, pain, migraine headache, and how CSD can arise in the seemingly healthy cerebral cortex. These questions are very difficult to answer because we don't have any model to induce migraine aura and migraine pain. So, and here we have actually the ATP sensitive potassium channels because as we heard earlier today from Professor Ashina that these channels are expressed in migraine-related structures. Beside that, these channels actually can be activated by a key molecules known to have a role in migraine, such as CGRB, PACAP, nitric oxide, and I'm going to show you a slide about that in a few minutes. And we also know that this compound here, we can see the compound leucomacalib. I need you to remember that Leucomacalim is a drug developed 30 years ago to treat hypertension. And the patients reported headache as a frequent side effect after leucomacalim. So we had a question now, can we use this channel to provoke migraine headache and provoke migraine aura? but we don't know the effect of these channels. We don't know the function of these channels. So now I have this slides for you. This may be very busy, but I need you to understand only two things about this slide. The first one is, we have the channel here, and this is our ATP sensitive potassium channels. Why we call it ATP sensitive or ATP dependent? Because when you have ATP, the channel is closed. And when it's closed, then the calcium channels, the voltage-dependent calcium channels, they will be open. So they are opposite to each other. When the ATP-sensitive potassium channel here, it is, uh, uh, it is open, then the voltage-dependent calcium channel will be closed. So we all know calcium in the cell. If I ask you which roles does a, a calcium have in the cell? Well, calcium has only two roles in the cell, either release of substances or contraction. So if we speak about smooth muscle cells, calcium will lead to contraction. If we speak about other cells in the body, we will have release. In this case here, we have a cell, beta cell from the pancreas. If we close the ATP sensitive potassium channels, then we will open calcium channels, calcium will will enter the cell and we will have release. How about if this cell was smooth muscle cells, then we will have contraction. So if we close this, we close the channel, we will have contraction. If we open the channel, then we will have a vasodilation. Did you have these points now? Yes. So how are these channels connected to what we know about, about migraine from previous studies? Will we know if we have CGRP, we have peptides re released from 
uh, uh, fibers, these will lead to activation of signaling pathways inside the cell and eventually we will activate the potassium channels and here I'm speaking about the ATP dependent potassium channels and also the big channels. We also heard about these channels uh, 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 in previous uh, lecture from Professor Eshi. Now, we asked two questions. The first one, can we induce migraine attacks by opening ATP sensitive potassium channels? And here with migraine attacks, I mean migraine aura and also migraine pain. The second question is, can we induce vasodilation in the cephalic arteries? Well, we use our human models at the Danish Headache Center. And here we can see the first results from migraine without aura patients. All migraine with aura migraine without aura patients. All migraine with or without aura reported migraine attacks, migraine pain. And we can also see the pain intensity in this figure. We saw also that opening of these channels induce sustained vasodilation of the cephalic arteries. But we couldn't see any signal in the a middle cerebral artery here. Now we moved forward. We included in the second study 17 migraine with aura patients, exclusively with aura patients. And we gave them leukomachaline in a double blind randomized clinical study. And we saw that 10 of the patients actually reported migraine with aura and some of them reported migraine without aura. So of course there was no migraine after uh, placebo and we will also, we have also the loca localization of the headache uh, 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 after leukomachalim comparing with the headache after spontaneous migraine attack. This data was actually also uh, supported by another study we did with healthy uh, uh, subjects, we invited healthy subjects and we gave them leukomachalim in uh, 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 six hours. And at the beginning, they have leukomachalim or placebo. And after that, we scanned them in different, in different time. And at the end, they have uh, sumatriptan. In this study, we saw a sustained dilation of the middle meningeal artery. So we have a molecule, KATP sensitive potassium channels that can induce migraine aura and migraine headache. And these channels, if you open them, you will have sustained vasodilation. Now, how does the KTP channel induce migraine? And here I would like to speak about migraine aura and also migraine pain. Let me begin with the migraine uh, pain first, and we will take uh, uh, the aura after that. This is the last slides I, I have, so you can, you can uh, uh, be happy. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. So how can we induce migraine pain? So I just told you, if we open this channel, then the potassium will go outside the cell. If we go outside the cell, the cell will be hypervolarized and you will have vasodilation. You can feel me here. This is the vessel. And after that, the vessel is dilated. So this dilation of the vessel, this is what we actually call here the mechanical activation. The dilation will give us mechanical activation of the fibers surrounding the vessels. And this mechanical activation will cause pain, will activate the trigeminal pain pathway. This is the first uh, uh, point here. The second one, we all know that the potassium is a positive ions. And positive ions, if they go outside the cell, they will enter 
to the surrounding cells, including the neurons, including the nociceptors. And if the potassium goes in the cell, then you will have chemical activation because potassium is positive and you will have depolarization of the cell. So these two mechanisms can explain why we could induce migraine pain, migraine headache. But why could we induce migraine aura? This is far more complicated than the headache because now I'm explaining that in the, uh, 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 not the central system. The aura might be in the central system. So migraine aura, it's far more complicated here. But the ex our explanation is very simple. If you give leukomacaline, leukomacaline is a very small molecule. I'm pointing at leukomacaline might enter the blood-brain barrier. And if it does do that, so we have a molecule that can open potassium channel in the glial cells surrounding the neurons. If you do that, then you will also have potassium surrounding the neurons. It means that the potassium will also enter the neurons and you will have depolarization wave. Depolarization wave is actually the definition of cortical spreading depression. So it does mean that you have migraine aura by one mechanism in the central nervous system and migraine pain outside the central, the, the central nervous system. That's all from me. Key points here, we know that opening of these channels cause migraine attacks with and without aura. We know that KATP channel induces sustained vasodilation. We also know that maybe a KATP channel emerges as potential therapeutic target for future treatment of migraine. Thank you uh, for listening to me and I'm looking forward to uh, listen to your questions. Thank you for the interesting presentation. And now if we have questions from the audience. I see people are lining up. Yes, hello, my name is Andrea Thompson, I'm from the Danish Health Center, and thank you for a very interesting and very promising presentation on the migraine aura, especially. I would like to discuss electrophysiology with you, um, because as you mentioned, uh, leucrocrum opens potassium channels, which leads to hyperpolarization, and the flux of ions across the membrane is dependent on concentration gradients and um, the voltage gradient. But as soon as you move just a very small amount of potassium outside the cell, you already have your hyperpolarization, and the net flux of the ions should stop. So is it really um, is it feasible that uh, the, the, the concentration of potassium outside the, the cells actually change? Because we don't see other symptoms of hyperkalemia, such as uh, cardiovascular or other uh, cortical dysfunction, uh, to, uh, which could uh, um, uh, be a sign of hyperpolarization or depolarization. Thank you. Very nice question. So when, when you were asking the question, I was thinking about the mitochondria because the mitochondria actually does the same about the concentration of the ions in micro environment. Because what you're asking about, about is, does the potassium increase in all the body fluids? No, this is not what I believe in. What I believe is the potassium increases in micro environments around the neurons and this is you will, we will be able to measure that maybe if you get a records uh, outside the neurons, but not in the uh, uh, CSF or in the plasma. Do you, do you have the question? Uh, yeah. We have another question from Dr. Gonzada. I have a... One question, uh, Dr. Gonzada, is... Uh, if we take this either situation that, that you have shown um, that activates the receptors and then uh, through the downstream mechanism. Which receptors? Then, uh, I don't speak about the receptors. Uh, no, I mean that uh, the first, uh, that you showed the first picture and then the. Uh, if we take this either situation, 
the, how you cover it, the time wise, in vivo, the pharmacology of vivo chromatin, from the infusion time to the onset of the headache, to the onset of power, how can you explain that, that, that is it possible to cover it with time, uh, step by step, or not? So, uh, what is the time, the, the, the median time of onset of migraine aura in our study? It was 45 minutes. What was the, the median time to onset of migraine headache? It was three hours. So it was actually, it was a time uh, between uh, the, the, the aura symptoms and also the migraine headache. Yes, we saw that in the study. But we saw also some patients reporting headache already after 10 minutes from the infusion and the same patients also reported migraine aura during the headache. And, and the question, your question is very, uh, 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 very nice because uh, did, do we expect to have migraine aura always before the headache or can we also have migraine aura during the headache and maybe also after uh, uh, the headache? So, so this is not, it's, it's not a, a must, a criteria to define migraine. In, in, in fact, uh, uh, some years ago, uh, Michael, uh, Russell and Yasuison showed that that the migraine was always very, I mean, quite heterogeneous. And you see some patients, they start having the aura symptoms, you know, overlapping the aura and headache. It's a it's one option. Another option is that the aura can also occur in the middle of the headache mm -hmm. phase. And the last option is that you can have aura without headache. Yeah. So. So from this, in this context, the mechanisms that you're explaining, the parallel mechanisms are interesting, but it's a bit complicated. A bit complicated. It's, I would say it's, it's a very simplistic model to explain that, but things are far complicated. We have also a question from online attendee. Marco Lissiti is asking whether metabolic impairment could result to opening of KGP channels in the brain. Of course, 100%. So, uh, 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 Professor Ashina and Nana Angwen showed some years ago that uh, hypoxia induced aura. And this is very nice uh, uh, study because, can, can I use this? Sure. Yeah. So, what we can see here, this is the mitochondria and a very simple time or draw, excuse me, for the mitochondria here. So, we know that if you have if you have hypoxia if you have hypoxia then the concentration of atp will go down this is what we know for sure and i just told you that the atp sensitive potassium channel they are blocked by atp but if you don't have atp They are open. So, if we don't have hypoxia, this channel will be closed. If we have hypoxia, this channel will be open. So maybe also the metabolic impairment that, that, that the hypoxia showed in that study could also be because of the ATP sensitive potassium channel. So we have to no longer, we don't have any more time to answer questions. And we move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Mohammed. And our last presenter for today is Roberto Deico. You saw him before during the debate. He's a neurologist from Mondino Foundation in Pavia and has uh, extensive research in migraine pathophysiology with a special interest in neurophysiology. And we're looking forward. Thank you, Lily, for the kind presentation. Hello again to everybody. I'm going to talk to you for uh, this uh, original data from our group, uh, that is uh, spinal sensitization and the role of the endocannabinoid system in induced migraine attacks. Before starting, I would like to provide very few information on the tools we will use in the next studies, uh, that is the nociceptive withdrawal reflex and the lower lead. It's a very, very simple neurophysiological tool 
we stimulate the sural nerve at the ankle and we record the muscular response in the bicep femoris. So everything in the lower limb, it's a spinal reflex, and then we look at the threshold. So the minimum electrical intensity that is able to produce a muscular response. So what we look at is the threshold. We can do it by a singular electrical stimulation or with five consecutive electrical stimulation that is a surrogate of the wind-up phenomenon at the spinal level. This study, 2011, showed for the first time that after nitroglycerin administration, the threshold of the nociceptive withdrawal reflex was lower, significantly lower, in migraine patients at two hours when compared to healthy controls. And this is a, a surrogate of spinal sensitization, so central sensitization in the human migraine model based on nitroglycerin administration, as you can see here. Here, we expand on those findings and we show that Patients with low frequency migraine had spinal central sensitization as well as patients with high frequency migraine, but patients with high frequency migraine had a more pronounced central sensitization when compared to low frequency migraine. And also, those patients with high frequency migraine had an early development of central sensitization. We also show that in patients with chronic migraine and medication overuse, after detoxification, there was an improved in spinal central sensitization that was coupled with a reduction of the enzymes involved in degradation of the endocannabinoids. Starting from these observations, we want to test the role of the endocannabinoid system in the acute phase of migraine related to central sensitization. To do so, we enrolled 24 migraine patients with high-frequency episodic migraine and 19 healthy controls comparable for age and sex. All subjects were tested baseline with blood sampling for anandamide and palmitoyletanolamide, two main endocannabinoids or endocannabinoids-related lipids, and the neurophysiological testing for both the threshold, the threshold with a single stimulus and the threshold with a temporal submission, so by the electrical stimulation. After that, all subjects received nitroglycerin, 0.9 mg sublingual, and repeated the same evaluation at 30, 60, and 120 minutes after nitroglycerin. In those patients who developed the migraine attacks during the three hours hospital observation, those patients underwent two additional measurements, one at migraine onset and one one hour later. Then all patients recorded what happened after hospital discharge in a headache ad hoc diary. Okay, clinical response. As expected, up to 66% of migraine patients develop a delay in migraine attacks, while no patient, while no subjects in the healthy controls develop a specific migraine attack. 13 migraine patients develop the migraine attack during the hospital observation phase. Indeed, they underwent the other two additional measurements during the study. At baseline, the levels of anandamide and palmitoyletanolamide were comparable between migraine patients and healthy controls, and also the two thresholds, RTH, single stimulus, and TST, temporal submission threshold, were comparable between migraine patients and healthy controls. Now, coming to the results, we confirm that spinal sensitization, so significantly reduction of thresholds of the nociceptive withdrawal reflex, was present in the human migraine models in migraine patients depicted in blue from 30 minutes until 120 minutes. But we also recorded a significant increase of these thresholds in healthy controls, which was an unexpected result as it was never described before in the other field. Regarding the endocannabinoid system, we found an increase of anandamide over time, but without significant differences between migraine patients and healthy control. By contrast, palmitoyletanolamide was increased only in migraine patients two hours after nitroglycerin administration. In the 13 patients who underwent the additional time points, we confirmed spinal central sensitization 
with uh, both thresholds, and specifically with the temporal sublimation threshold at uh, migraine onset and one hour later. And again, we found a specific increase of palmitoid etanol amide one hour after migraine onset. This is a very important result. We look for correlation between modification of the endocannabinoid system and anandamide uh, palmitoid etanol amide and modification of the neurophysiological parameters, but we were not able to find any significant correlation between these two variables. So, we confirm future that spinal central sensitization is a core feature of the nitroglycerin migraine model as described before, and this is in line with the idea that the nitroglycerin induce a pure migraine attack with similar features to the spontaneous one. We demonstrated an association within migraine severity, namely multiple migraine days and pain modulation at least at spinal level. The unexpected habituation phenomenon was probably due to a very intensive neurophysiological stimulation because this is the first time that we test both thresholds in healthy subjects and migraine patients. But this provided an additional observation because the central sensitization that arose in migraine patients prevented the habituation phenomenon that we saw in healthy controls. Anandamide did not differ between migraine patients and healthy controls. By contrast, the pair release may play a role in the acute migraine phase with analgesic and anti-inflammatory role, and we speculate that this might represent a future therapeutic target. At state or art, our results are not able to support any correlation and any association between the modulation of the endocannabinoid system and central sensitization. As before, I would like to thank all the people working in Pavia and you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, for your thank presentation. You. And uh, if there are any questions from the audience, so, um, I would like to ask you a question. I saw in your baseline characteristics of the patients we included in your study that almost half of the patients, they were on preventive medication. Yeah, it's true. So, do you think, did you ask, uh, did you compare between the subgroups that were on preventive and not, if you could find any differences in the sensitization? We, we do this kind of analysis, but the sample size was not enough to differentiate between them, and we do not found any significant difference between these two populations. And uh, I also have to say that the absolute values were not that different. So it's true that this may be underpowered for this specific question, but I don't have the feeling that this would change. In the, we uh, choose to uh, of course, uh, why we include patients on preventive medication, it was to preserve the feasibility of the study. It's not so clear, of course. And uh, we enroll only patients in preventive medication with uh, a minor role on central sensitization. So not tricyclics, not antiepileptics, drugs, and something like that. But just to control for the aspects. So we have a question. If we can get the microphone. So, uh, excellent presentation. I have a question on the endocrinoids. Uh, I, I probably missed, did you, you did mention that in blood samples or where did you? Peripheral blood samples, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Anandamide and palmitoletanolamide in peripheral blood samples. Venus okay. uh, samples. Mm -hmm. We, we are currently making pre make preparation of manuscript where we measure the endocannabinoids in CSF in inter migraine patients, and which were a large number, so almost 200 migraine patients, one with migraine with aura and one with migraine without aura and controls. And what we actually uh, found is that uh, the, the, the endocannabinoids that are disturbed in these patients inter -ictally, is, is much more related to lifetime depression than migraine itself. So my question is, did you uh, correct for, for depression in your samples? Yeah, yes, because depression was uh, an exclusion criteria. So the, the yeah, samples for, are... For us it was the same. So, uh, so we excluded patients with severe depression, but nevertheless we, we also assessed, assessed 
would uh, ask the question you know, whether there was a depressive symptoms. And uh, we had a very excellent talk today about the state and trait of depressive symptoms. So, uh, although we excluded migraine patients with severe depression, still uh, depressive symptoms are there among patients. And it seems that endocrinoids findings were related more to depressive symptoms than migraine itself. So, I think it's very important to take this into account when you look at the endocrinoid system in migraines. I think this is very important insights uh, also for the future because uh, if you are telling us that uh, excluding patients with severe symptoms is not enough, we have to control more for this kind of uh, uh, mood uh, alterations. It's very important. In this setting, the, uh, the fact that these are modulated after nitroglycerin administration may partially control for that. But I think that it's very important to take this uh, as a take-home message for future uh, studies for the endocannabinoid system. Thanks. Isola, did you find uh, any relationship to the migraine frequency um, and, uh, and the concentration? I have to look in the manuscript. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware currently, to be honest. Uh, but I think, I think studying the cannabinoid system is extremely interesting and I think you have a totally different approach which is also extremely interesting because one of the fallbacks from our study is that we included patients in an interactive phase while or are we going to measure or take lumbar function in interactive state but as you it's, it's more easier of course than asking patients to come during an attack and we Actually, our exclusion criteria were severe chronic migraineurs with severe depression, and now I think maybe we should have selected also chronic migraine patients. But we started the study many, many years ago, even when the discussion of long vacation was not there. So Did you I find think it? all these studies need to add to each other to look at what's the role of endocannabinoids in the migraine. But was it any difference between aura and without aura? No. We published a paper in which we compare uh, CB1, CB2 receptors, but also uh, gene expression of uh, enzymes involved in the metabolism of uh, the endocannabinoid system. And there was a, a, a clear difference between chronic migraine patients with medication overuse, episodic migraine patients, and healthy controls. I have the sample size was not that big, there was preliminary results, but uh, there seemed to have a, a gradient of expression across the most severe phenotype of the disease. Yes, and one last question. I am not uh, very familiar with all the byproducts of uh, the endocannabinoids and the metabolic pathway, but I was wondering if you would expect a different result if you would measure different byproducts. Yes, uh, probably yes. Uh, we test, uh, um, we do not test uh, two acylglycerol, which is another very important endocannabinoid. Uh, so this is a lack of the study, and probably it could uh, give us some uh, other results. Uh, here we do not test the expression of the enzymes that are also very important to understand how they modify and uh, how uh, we can justify the increase or the lowering of the expression of the single endocannabinoids. So it's very important for the future, yeah. Thank you. If there are no more questions from the audience, I think uh, we can conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you very much for your Thank talk. You.